on this edition of Independent Sources, Small Business, Big City. How New York's efforts to encourage small businesses is bucking a national trend. And we read too. A young computer programmer creates a mobile app that's more digital library. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Here's your host, Gary Pierre-Pierre. Small businesses in New York City are receiving a shot in the arm from a series of programs geared at getting minorities and women in particular to invest. This is an effort to buck a national trend of blacks and Hispanics receiving fewer business loans at higher interest rates compared to their white counterparts. Zyphus LeBron spoke with Greg Bishop, the commissioner of New York City's Small Business Services, and Andrew Hone, the president of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, about some of these initiatives and why it's important to get minorities and immigrants involved in small business development. All right, so before we start our conversation, I'd like to take in a clip from City uh, Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito at her recent State of the City address. When times were tough and entire neighborhoods were written off, our small businesses stood strong and helped make areas like Flatbush what they are today. So whether you're at La Cruana in Stapleton, Tom's Restaurant in Coney Island, or Casa Latina Music Shop on East 116th Street, we know that we must continue to support our small businesses and eliminate barriers that hinder their success. So the speaker just talked about eliminating barriers that hinder the, the success of small businesses. And I know that both you gentlemen are very much involved in, part of, in being part of that process. So I'll start with you, Greg. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. First, let's talk about some of the barriers that small businesses have faced. Um, one of them is in the case of uh, minority small businesses, they have traditionally faced difficulty when it comes to lending, uh, lending at higher rates. Mm -hmm. How is the city trying to address this in particular? Right. So a couple of things, thanks for, for having me, and I'm, I'm really excited that the speaker pointed out Flatbush because I grew up in Flatbush. And, uh, there's over 200,000 small businesses in New York City, and they represent um, the economic backbone of the city. Um, so at our agency, Small Business Services, our job is really to unlock the potential of small businesses. Uh, in particular, uh, we provide nine set of services uh, from access to capital uh, to navigating government uh, to really help businesses start, expand, and operate in the city. The mayor uh, recently, in September, uh, really doubled down his commitment to helping minority and women-owned businesses, not only announcing a 30% goal, new goal for uh, procurement, but also announcing a new set of uh, products that we think will address some of the issues we've seen with uh, small minority-owned companies like Access to Capital. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a number of products, uh, one of which will be launched uh, in a couple weeks, uh, where we are actually providing up to half a million dollars uh, two MWBs that are either bidding or uh, are working on a city contract at a 3% interest rate. Okay. Uh, so we think that will address some of the concerns that we've heard from minority and women-owned businesses. Wow, that's great. So at, at uh, half a, a million, you said? Yes, $500,000. Oh, wow. uh, right now we have a, a similar program, which it's at $125,000. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, to you, your point is that what we've heard from small businesses is the cost of capital. Right. Um, and, you know, in the time I've been in the role as commissioner and, and just working uh, with small businesses, you know, access to capital is one of the number one barriers. Uh, and then access to a, a workforce, uh, finding the right talent. Right, right. Now, Andrew, I know that uh, the chamber recently received a grant of, uh, of about $125,000, I believe it was, from the Treasury. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you guys are really very much about promoting small businesses. How is that money, um, do you see that money being kind of sparsed out to these small businesses? Sure, and just again, thank you for having me on. And uh, the commissioner here is being uh, very humble. His job is, is gargantuan, and mm -hmm. you don't get to use that word often. But uh, the commissioner oversees a citywide effort to drive what everyone knows and what the speaker clearly 
indicated that small businesses are the engine of the New York City economy. Um, and just to throw some numbers about Brooklyn mm -hmm. um, at you, uh, there are 570,000 jobs located in Brooklyn. It's a huge economy. Uh, and the population of almost 2.7 million people makes it the, one of the most populous counties in the entire country. And if you look at it, 40% of those jobs are located in firms with less than 50 yep. employees. Right. So bottom line is, whatever you think about New York City and about Brooklyn, it's a small business-driven economy. Mm -hmm. And these are the firms that are providing employment for people. If you get even more granular into that, those numbers, you look at it, half of those firms are immigrant-owned mm -hmm. businesses. Right. Mm -hmm. So the storyline, the trajectory of New York City is really about immigrant-driven small business driven economy and uh, you had mentioned the CDFI grant we were we were very fortunate to receive uh, funding from Treasury and it was supported by our entire congressional delegation uh, who is an outstanding uh, delegation and uh, they gave us a simple mission that we are underserving immigrants and minorities mm -hmm. uh, and really uh, it is the storyline of how these businesses do is how New York does. Yes, right. uh, and every single day across this country, 8,000 uh, businesses are denied a loan. Um, and those are for various reasons. Uh, in New York City, we're just recovering our lending uh, to the same rates that we saw uh, at the time of the Great Recession. Right. So this is a really mm -hmm. fundamental moment where we're looking and saying, we're just getting back on track. And so how do we do more to serve businesses? Yes. Right. Right. And fundamentally, it is through lending. And I think small business services and the commission, what we do is to really get money into the hands of small mom and pops, immigrants yep. and minority businesses. Right. And I wanted to pick up, I'm sorry, Greg, just before, when we talk about small businesses now, and I know there's a lot of talk about the tech sector in mm -hmm. New York mm -hmm. and so forth. When we talk about small businesses, are we talking about small businesses in the tech sector? Are we talking about mom and pop shops? You know, someone comes in from, you know, yeah. another country that starts a small business, whether it might yeah. be a coffee shop or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Most of the businesses that we work with have 10 or less employees. Um, and uh, we are talking about the businesses across all sectors, uh, but really what we're talking about is micro businesses. And Andrew, you know, is a terrific partner of ours. Uh, they actually, the Brooklyn Chamber runs our NYC Business Solutions Center in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And that is our uh, outward facing uh, service for small businesses. I'm glad to be here because a lot of small business owners uh, they are not aware of the services that's available. New York City is really resource rich uh, between the chambers, uh, between uh, our agency, even between the, the federal government in terms of the services available uh, to small uh, business entrepreneurs uh, to actually get connected to services. Right. Uh, but the challenge is really uh, getting uh, connected to them. Uh, so, and especially immigrant entrepreneurs, mm -hmm, right. um, you know, one of the things that we have uh, done is we launched uh, through a private-public partnership with City Community Development, uh, our Immigrant Business Initiative, uh, working with local organizations that are trusted in immigrant communities uh, to sort of be the face of our services. Right. Uh, because one of the challenges is that, you know, we are, we are the government. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I come into a, into a, a store and I tell the, the property owner, the, the store owner, that I'm, I'm here to help. I'm met with skepticism, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, right. So, right. or sometimes confusion. You know, <laughs> right. really? Are you really trying right. to help me? Um, but we really want to make sure that business owners know that we have these services at mm -hmm. no cost to them. Um, and certainly our, 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 our focus and goal is really to help them grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just on the point about you'd ask, is, what's tech or what is this yeah. really? Um, so... The information systems technology that's the fastest growing part of the Brooklyn economy, but the second and third largest employers in Brooklyn are retail and tourism. Hmm. Uh, the number one is meds and eds, right? So right. hospitals and education systems. So if you actually say, well, where do you want to make the largest splash? It is exactly what the commissioner yep. is saying. It's in mom and pop retail. Uh, it's in the tourism trade, which tends to be grown out of the mom and pop retail sector. Right. So uh, if you want to make an impact, uh, you invest in local community streets. Uh, and I mean that. It gets right. real local. Um, the I Love Your Local campaign yep. just launched right. recently, which is a focus on cornerstone businesses that have anchored neighborhoods that need some help to adapt to change and grow and, and, yep. and move with the times because they're, you know, bricks and mortar are a little less adaptable than an app that you have on your phone in your pocket. Right. 
Right. So if you focus and concentrate your efforts on these retail businesses, tourism, trade, you're making your biggest impact in the economy. Okay. Yep. Now, Andrew just mentioned something that I was going to get to a little later on in the conversation, <laughs> but might as well mm-hmm. dovetail into it now. It's this uh, New York uh, Love Your Local. Yep. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the program and, and how folks could get involved in the program? So it's a new service that we launched uh, at Small Business Services. And again, the mayor's focus on really uh, helping uh, mom and pop uh, small business thrive in New York City. Uh, so the Lovely Year Local campaign is exactly that. Uh, we want to show and highlight uh, local small businesses that are in the community, that are, con- the, that are the cornerstone of those communities. We all have those businesses. Mm-hmm. We know, you know, either the cleaners that I've gone to since, you know, my mom has been, you know, going there, or we have that favorite restaurant, or we have some service uh, or uh, industry uh, business that we've been going to, the hardware store, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Uh, but they've been a staple in that community. And certainly New York City is a fantastic city to open up a business, to do business. Uh, but we do have a lot of business and a lot of competition. And in every changing neighborhood, we want to make sure those businesses actually adapt to it. Right. Uh, so for my my local cleaners, for example, uh, you know, they know me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if I were to go in there and, and go and look under the hood, they may not have a profile of, of who I am right. or have a way to electronically connect to me right. and, and send me information about you know, either you know, sales or, or what mm-hmm. have you. So we want to make sure we equip uh, local businesses. So we launched a campaign uh, on February 14th, mm-hmm. Valentine's Day, <laughs> uh, uh, appropriately. Right. Um, so, biz- so individuals, regular New Yorkers can nominate a small business. Mm-hmm. They have to be independent, uh, okay. so they can't be a chain. Uh, and they have to be um, in business for three or more years. We're okay. going to give preference to long-standing businesses. Right, longevity. Um, exactly. And all it is, it's really just going to nyc.gov slash loveyourlocal, nominating a business, or they can use the hashtag uh, loveyourlocalnyc uh, to actually nominate a business. And what that does is un- it unlocks an opportunity for those businesses to apply for a grant up to $90,000. Oh. Um, and that's the first time we've been able to uh, to actually grant uh, funds. Mm-hmm. Uh, so f- later this year, we'll be narrowing down the businesses. Um, actually, it's been a terrific uh, campaign. Uh, so far, we have over a 1,000 businesses wow. uh, that have been uh, nominated. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also serves as a marketing tool uh, because now I can you know, click on the map and, and go to Coney Island and see all you know, the favorite businesses in Coney Island or East Flatbush, or you know Midwood, or any area ac- across the, the five boroughs. Right, because there's an interactive aspect to this program correct. as well, where it, the um, the businesses show up on a, on a map online. Yes. Correct. Yep. Now, um, you notice he only said three Brooklyn names. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, because you know, you're here, Andrew. He's, he's from Brooklyn. The Delta, the only Brooklyn's. Good, so he's, he's giving me that off stage I, 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 I love the city of New York. Right. And there's terrific businesses in all five boroughs, but you know when I'm sitting with Andrew. I have to. I have to I, talk listen, about. Brooklyn I understand. I, 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 you know, I live in Jersey now, but I'm I'm a Brooklyn guy. We want you back. Here. We'll <laughs> <want them. laughs> um, I just want to ask also to um, the number of businesses that will be um, that will have access to this grant. Now, is it limited to five, ten? How many are you are you looking? Uh, how many businesses are looking for? So it's going to be a funnel. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the, the first part of the campaign is is the marketing and promotion. Uh, so that's where we're going to have the most scale mm-hmm. in terms of reaching and, and highlighting uh, most of the businesses. Uh, then we're going to funnel it down uh, ultimately to about 20 businesses uh, that are going to be able to receive this grant. Uh, but it's a start. And certainly for those that do not receive the grant, uh, there's a wealth of other services that we have uh, to really help those businesses uh, from access to capital. Uh, mm-hmm. So we've, last year we connected businesses over $60 million in capital, and we work with a network of 40 lenders uh, to our uh, compliance advisory service uh, where we'll be able to send out staff uh, to be more proactive. Mm-hmm. A lot of businesses have said uh, that the city should not be in the business of fining, and the mayor agreed, and we've cut fines uh, from um, you know, different regulatory agencies by half, right. uh, but certainly we want to be more proactive. Mm-hmm. So we want to actually go out and, and point out areas that you may actually get a fine and have and help those businesses correct before uh, they get fined. Right. So, uh, so there's a number of services that uh, business owners may not even be aware of, but right. now we're able to connect them to those opportunities. Right. And when you talk about fines, you're talking about, you know, um, b- Issues so, with the building and the yeah, ventilation. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously we're a complex city. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, over eight and a half million people. Uh, most of them are in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and certainly we have to keep the city safe. Uh, but we want to make sure 
uh, that the regulatory agencies, in, in part of doing their job, uh, that we also help businesses learn how to be compliant and then also challenge some of the agencies um, that are doing the, the compliance work um, whether or not some regulations are still necessary. Mm -hmm. Technology has changed the, the environment, uh, so sometimes we, we're successful in eliminating some regulatory burdens. Um, and other times it's a matter of really uh, training the inspectors mm -hmm. on how to deliver customer service to a business client. I see. Mm -hmm. now, now, Andrew, one of the things, we, you know, we're, we're drawing near on the end of our conversation. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm intrigued by, actually, is the fact that um, there's been a lot of conversation about the involvement of banks, and not just getting money or grants from the city, but mm -hmm. the involvement of banks, large banks, small banks. And part, I think, just from kind of standing away from the conversation and looking, is that part of the conversation I feel that's missing out here is a little bit about the... Um, credit unions. Mm -hmm. I know that credit unions for a lot of immigrants mm -hmm. are the way that they start their, their, you know, just their life here, the way they, they save and, and so forth. Are credit unions being left out of the conversation with small businesses, do you uh, think? You know, they're really actually a remarkable tool. And if you, you think about what happened again post recession, uh, Dodd Frank came into to effect. A lot of the big banks uh, who actually want to make small business loans target immigrants, target minority-owned businesses, mm -hmm. uh, actually can't. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, we're seeing uh, through the business solution centers, mm -hmm. uh, customer after customer, I call them customers because they're coming in looking for loans, and uh, they're asking, you know, we were, we were rejected for this, that, and the other reason. It's, it's none of it's bad. Um, it's just that they have been denied traditional lines of credit. Um, that's where the credit unions come in, CDFIs, community development, financial institutions come in, where now all of a sudden you're saying there's a new mix of players that come into the market mm -hmm. that can lend to businesses that may not meet the traditional qualifications but are absolutely good bets, and they're absolutely the drivers of uh, small businesses and the economy in, in New York. And I just think what is really fascinating to me is if you, you look, if you get even really deep into the numbers on this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, that you're looking at a, a crisis of lending. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you cannot do enough to get money out on the street. Uh, to think that uh, just from what we're seeing, 2014, only 1.5% of all loans right. made, CDFI loans made out there were to black-owned businesses. That is a a big and sharp and painful number. Um, it has to be improved, and that's where we need to draw in from the credit unions, the CDFIs, uh, any sort of non-traditional lender, and come up with new ways of getting it out there. Because as long as the as regulations that are currently on the books stay in place, uh, we will struggle uh, right. getting money into the hands of the people that need it the most. Right. They can do the most good with it. Um, so you're asking the best question is really how do we look around the, the non-traditional lending mm -hmm. atmosphere mm -hmm. and say what can we do to promote it more? And I think when you have programs like what we run with the Business Solutions Center mm -hmm. uh, in conjunction with, uh, uh, with the commissioner's agency, here's your best venue, right. uh, your best option. Uh, you cannot invest enough resources into these because they are the way that we will drive the New York City economy. Yeah, 75% right. of our our lending last year uh, was through CDFIs. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so really, uh, they've stepped up, um, but like Andrew said, uh, we can do a lot more uh, in terms of connecting to especially black-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, the work that we're doing, uh, working with um, many lenders uh, to understand their products. Uh, one of the things, entrepreneurs spend a lot of time uh, they waste a lot of time finding the right source of capital. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and sometimes they get the wrong capital. Right. Um, and we have to educate, and our job really is to educate business owners on, on what is the right capital and what is the wrong, wrong capital. capital. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, that's, that's the, the work that, that's ahead for us. All right. Well, gentlemen, it's been a great conversation, but we have to end it right here. Greg Bishop, Andrew Hohn, thank you again for being in studio. Thank, thank you, you for having us. All right. Yeah. Still to come on the show, a mobile app makes it easier to access books written by people of color. Finally from us, We Read 2 is a mobile library that collects the work of people of color that features characters of color. The app was created by Kaya Thomas, who is now a senior at Dartmouth College. Zyphus LeBrun spoke with Thomas via Skype about the program that started as a passion project. Hi, Kaya. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So, Kaya Thomas, creator of the We Read 2 app. 
Let's tell the audience a little bit about the app. Why did you decide to create it? So We Read 2 is a book resource application that features children and young adult books all written by authors of color featuring characters of color. And for me, I created it because I've always loved to read since I was a little girl. But when I became a teenager, I realized that I wasn't seeing myself represented in the books that I was reading. Um, and once I got to college, I learned how to code, and I decided to use those skills then to put towards a resource that can help people like me and expose people to books written by authors of color with characters of color. Okay. Now, you st- when did you start the app? Um, about three years ago, almost. It'll be three years in August. So I was 18, actually, when I started the app. It was the summer after my freshman year of college. Oh, wow. What's the response been like over these last three years? It's been incredible. I've just been overwhelmed and grateful about all the people who've been inspired by the app. Librarians, educators, parents, students have all really shown me that it's a useful resource. And so I've been really trying to grow the resource over the last couple of years. Because when I relaunched it, it only had 300 books in the app, and now it has over 600 books. So. Oh, wow. Are you partnering with any people to kind of increase the library that's available um, to, to folks through the app? I'm not partnering with any organizations or anything. Um, I'm kind of a one-woman team, but I have worked with some students actually at my school. I've been able to um, have some funds to help them um, learn about databases and learn about how this resource works, and they've helped me grow the resource and kind of go through and review some of the materials people have submitted. What do you hope to, to do with the app in the future? How do you want it to grow? Yeah, my first goal is to get the resource to over a thousand books. Um, There are amazing books out there written by authors of color, but a lot of times they don't have necessarily their marketing skills or the opportunity to be backed by a big publisher. So sometimes the authors just publish their own books on Amazon and they don't have kind of the resources to get it out there. So I really want to expose everyone to these books and give these authors the opportunity to have their work showcased and celebrated. Um, So I'm really trying to grow the resource to a thousand books this year. I see. And and how are you going to manage to do that? Are you reaching out to folks or is it kind of like you doing it through your own process? Have you started uh, a few years ago? So in the app itself, there is a submission um, portion. So people can submit a title they think that should be in the app. And over the last two years, I've gotten over a thousand, you know, suggestions. And so I'm going to go through those suggestions. Right now, there are about 800 suggestions I have to kind of siphon through. Um, And so a lot of users have been suggesting titles that they think should be in the app. And I've gotten a lot of emails and requests from authors saying, hey, you know, can you put my book in the app? Um, And so there's a lot of books out there. Uh, It's just about kind of crowdsourcing them and putting them all in one place. Mm -hmm. Because what I found when I was doing the research before I created Movie 2 is there are some blogs and some websites out there that may have, you know, 10 books by this type of author here and there. But there's no collective resource where you can find all the books in one place. So that's why I wanted to create Movie 2. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, how important do you think this is? I mean, you mentioned that you thought that uh, you didn't see people who looked like you in, in, the, in the books. How important is that, do you think, for people to kind of experience that, see people who look like them in the books that uh, we read? I think it's incredibly important, especially in fiction. Um, fiction is my favorite genre. And I think it's incredibly important because fiction allows people to learn and really empathize with the stories of the characters. And so if you're reading fiction and you see, wait, there's no fiction characters that are similar to me or telling my story, you kind of feel like you're erased or you're invisible or that your story doesn't matter. And so I think it's important, especially for kids at a young age, to feel like their stories are being told and feel like they matter and that, you know, their voice really matters and they exist. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's also important for everyone to be exposed to different stories and different cultures because then it allows you to understand like the differences that we all face in our lives and the different cultures and how they approach life and it allows you a better sense of understanding and if you build that you know as a young child or a teen I think it will really help you when you're adult you know to approach difference in a way where it's more understanding rather than you know aversion or hate. Mm -hmm. Now are these books on the app are they just children's book or do the children's books or do they run the gamut? So they're anywhere from picture books to young adult books. I decided to focus on kids and teens um, because at the time I was a teenager when I created it. um, And I was really focusing on, you know, the young, young people. And I think young people need to be exposed to this 
literature first. But I do have plans to eventually open it up to adult fiction and so expose people to authors of color who are writing about characters of color in adult fiction as well. Um, but first, I want to grow the resource as, as much as I can for children's and young adult books. Mm -hmm. So Kaya, final question to you. Uh, I know that through the app that you have access, folks will have access to all these various books. Um, are you considering any sort of partnerships with perhaps Amazon.com or even BarnesandNoble.com whereby folks could see books on your app and then purchase them on either one of those websites? Yeah, I mean, I think in the future I would love to have a partnership with a larger company or organization that has access to the rights to these books so you can have previews in the app or you can directly order it. I think that would be great. But having, you know, those type of partnerships takes it takes a team. It doesn't take one person. It takes a lot of resources and time. So I hope that, you know, after I graduate this summer that I'm able to then start really working on these things and networking and expanding it so that I can do something much larger with it. And that's really my hope for it. Best of luck to you, Kaya, with your endeavors and of the app and in school as you move on. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great rest of your day. You too. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.